Right. Before the break, what we did, we looked at the large signal behavior of the BJT, MOSFET, differ differential pairs in B done in implemented in BJT, implemented in MOSFET, and done for an arbitrary three-terminal device. So now what we are going to do, we are going to look at these things, but from a small signal perspective. Because once we make the small signal perspective assumption, then there are a lot of more things that we can say about it. Of course, we know that we are making another simplifying assumption, perhaps a big one, but it's important for us. And now, the beauty of this thing is that the small signal model of these three look very similar. So when we look at the small signal models, I mean, there's some very small variations, but the general behavior remains the same. So if you understand one, essentially you've understood all of them. Um, especially, especially since for the case of MOSFET, we, we saw that the body effect does not play a role, right? Because of the fact that the two sources are at the same voltage. So as long as there's no degeneration there, those two sources remain at the same voltage, so the body effect is not going to play a role. So you really don't have to think about the back gate transistor. Right? And what that does, it enables you, I mean, for the most part, there are some scenarios for the common mode calculations that you need to, may need to take into account, but for most cases, you don't need to worry about it. And what that does is that it allows you to look at essentially the same model for all three of them, or everything, essentially. Not all three of them, for any kind of three-terminal device and deal with that. So let's do it for the bipolar one uh, quickly. We have it down up there. And then the MOSFET one, we'll talk about it as we go, see how it's different. So in the bipolar, we have alpha RM, right? And then we have alpha IE, this being IE. So let's call it alpha RM here. And then that goes, if you look at the differential pair that we have up there, you have the RC. And then this is that common terminal. So then you have the other transistor. So this is VI plus or VI minus. Um, and then you have the RC. Of course, it's connected to ground because it's connected to VCC, which is an AC ground. So this is VO plus VO minus. And this is, again, alpha RM. This is IE. Well, this is really IE1, IE2. And this is alpha IE2. This is alpha IE1. And what do we have in the bottom? Well, if you look at our differential pair up there, the differential pair that we are starting with, the way we've drawn it, so let's, let's get rid of these for now. Let's go back to the standard one. Well, if I kept it this way, if we kept it really like this, what do we see when we go to small signal model? Open circuit, right? So that would be it. Whatever we had here would be it. There's no, nothing here. So let's make it even more interesting. Let's make it, make some sort of, an, make it non-ideal. Let's say you have some REE, so some output resistance. So you have some non-ideal current source. And if then in that case, still the current source becomes a short open circuit, right? An open circuit. What, the, what, what is left would be just the REE, right? As a result. So you have the REE here. That's the equivalent model for essentially all of them. Now, if you have a MOSFET, alpha is 1 in this case, and we are ignoring RO in these things for now, so in all of them. But let's, let's see what, how that behaves. So, so all of them are essentially the same thing. Now, let's think about it. Let's say you have your input voltage. We talked about this last time. If you have some VI plus and, VI, and, and some VI minus, then you could write a VID, which is VI plus minus VI minus, and a VIC, the differ that's a differential one, and this is the common mode one, which is VI plus plus VI minus divided by 2. And of course, these two can be converted into this combination, as we did this last time. So you have a VIC, and then you can break that into easily into two different pieces. So you can say, I have the differential part that can be written as VID over 2 and negative VID over 2. Because that's what you would get if you solve for this. Because you can say VI plus is going to be VIC plus VID over 2. And VI minus is going to be, if you solve very quickly, you will see VIC minus VID over 2. So this equivalent circuit. This is equivalent to the two sources of 
vi plus and vi minus. So we can call a v, last time I think we called them v1 and v2. So these two are equal, equal, right? So now if I can apply this thing, this equivalent circuit to that. You say, well, what, what good is it? You took two voltage sources, made them into three. Well, it's good because now we are dealing with linear circuits, right? Unlike before when we were talking about nonlinear large signal stuff, now we are dealing with linear circuit. And linear circuit have this wonderful property called superposition, right? So now you can apply these independently and see how it behaves. So you can apply these two together, and then you can apply this independently to both terminals and see what the behavior looks like. And that leads, those, those two lead to two different equivalent circuits, actually, simplified equivalent circuits. We call them equivalent half circuits for differential and single energy. So let's apply the differential, because that's the part we really care about, right? You start with the thing that you care about, and then you worry about the things you care about less. So if, I just, if you just apply those things, if we apply vid over 2 and half vid over 2 here, or negative, I'm sorry, negative half vid over 2, so this is plus and minus, that's a purely differential signal. There's a key observation to be made here. If that's your Im only input, what is this voltage? And to think about that, think about a, a seesaw. Those two resistors are equal, equal, right? They're both alpha RMs, or if there was MOSFET, they would be RMs, right? And you're applying opposite voltages, the two ends. What's happening to that red cap? It's staying constant, right? That point is that red cap. So if it's constant, then we have another theorem from network theory that comes and helps us. It's the substitution theorem. It says, if the voltage of a node is known to be a certain value, you can always replace that node with a voltage source of that value. But what is that value in this case? It's not only constant, but it's actually something, a special constant, because they're going in opposite direction. So that's zero. Right? So this voltage is identically zero for this kind of perturbation. Therefore, I can replace it with a voltage source of value zero, which is also called a short circuit. Agreed? You good? You don't look completely convinced. What's bothering you? Okay. Okay, all right. But if you, if you have a question, so think about it this way. Think about it that these two initially are at zero, right? So this, is, this voltage is zero, this voltage is zero, the middle point is zero. This goes up a little bit, this goes down by the same amount. That would remain at zero. And if it remains at zero, substitution theorem says that in a linear circuit, you can replace it with a voltage source of zero value, short circuit, done. So now, if this is short-circuited, then you can see the left half and right half of the circuit are basically separate. First of all, this guy doesn't matter anymore. This RE is irrelevant because it's short-circuited on both sides. And you can actually see that you have two half circuits that are independent. So this one wouldn't matter, right? These, these are the two things. So I can remove this. Nothing will happen, right? We do it all the time when we draw circuits. And I basically have to two identical half circuits. So what I need to really do is to look at one half of them and analyze that. So this is VID over two. What is this voltage if this was purely differential? Do you agree that this voltage would be VOD? That, that's the definition of VOD, right? And do you agree by symmetry or anti-symmetry really? This would be then VOD over two and this would be negative VOD over two, right? So the equivalent half circuit for this thing is this drawing, is this thing.
And this is VID over 2, and this is VOD over 2. Right? And this is, of course, alpha IE. So this is IE, alpha IE. Or even, actually, you could say that the equivalent, half circuit equivalent for this, is this circuit. Right? Because that's basically what the equivalent half circuit looks like. So this is VID over 2, and this is VOD over 2. So you can even think about it that way, realizing that this is the circuit, but we, when we are doing this, we are really thinking about the small signal part of this, which is, if this is VID over 2, this is going to be GM VID over 2, and the total current through here. That's the total current drawn. So if I ask you, what's the gain? of the stage, we need to determine one thing. We know the drive. We know the second thing. We know the, we know the current drive. We, know we need the second thing. What is the second thing? The resistance, right? Or, or impedance in general. So looking up, you see RC. If you want to even take RO into account, it's RO. So it's GM. What, what do we know? It, what we know is that the ratio of VOD over 2 divided by VID over 2 is going to be negative GMRC, or if you want to take the RO into account, it will be GMRC parallel with RO. Right. So really, it's just parallel RO. But you can say negative GMRC, assuming RC is much smaller than RO for now. And what is this quantity? Well, this is VOD over VID, right? The, the halves cancel, which is by definition the differential gain. of the stage. So the differential gain of this stage is the differential gain of the common emitter. Is it surprising? You remember how we constructed this to begin with? We took two common emitters, had them share the same current. Little caveat here. Be careful. Because GM is now the GM of each one of these transistors. Now, these two transistors are sharing the same current. So for example, if they were BJTs, the GM of each one of them, for, if, you, if you were running it off of one milliamp, it means that each one of them in balance case get half a milliamp. So your GM is going to be half that of a single stage. So you have to think about that, think about it that way. So you get half as much GM because of this, but I mean, in a MOSFET, it's less pronounced because it's square root dependence. So it's a specific thing. But the benefits definitely outweigh the disadvantage in many, many, many cases. Yes? So the way this is different is you basically only have like the two resistors going. Oh, OK. Go ahead. Yeah? Um, is that the, in that case, the resistance is different? Good question. So, so the question is here. If you, you remember we had, we talked about this before, say, well, look, you know, if you wanted to expand the range, we put two resistors here. But now let's think about half circuit in that case. Now, still, if you look at the, your model, your equivalent small signal model, before we did this, right? So then these two resistors will be here. And this would be, so this would be REE, -E, and these are REs. Again, between these four resistors, this point is still ground, symmetrical. Well, it's really anti-symmetrical. Right? So this resistor still disappears, because it's shorted by that voltage source of 0 volts. Right? These two don't. So what would happen to our, my equivalent model? So my equivalent model, in that case, becomes alpha RM, RE, Um, RC, alpha IE, right? This basically, or, or even better, the, the half circuit equivalent is this. And you remember we did analyze these things. That's why we spent so much time analyzing these things. So now we can actually use that result very quickly. We know what the gain is, right? What is the gain? Total resistance in the collector divided by total resistance in the emitter times alpha if you want to really care about that. But just ballpark is this divided by this plus RM. So the gain of this thing now is RC divided by RM, alpha RM, 
let's say Rm plus Re, right? It's really alpha here, alpha there, but let's forget about that for now. Um, OK, and what is that? So it's basically, you can multiply it by Gm. So you get Gmrc divided by 1 plus Gmrc. This is the way the textbooks like, uh, textbooks like to show it. Uh, I think this is probably more meaningful. Uh, but anyway, so you can see that the gain is reduced by a factor of 1 plus Gmrc. Yes? R E, yes, thank you. This is R E, G M R E. One plus G M R E, not G M R C sorry. I misspoke. Thank you. So it's basically it's reduced by a factor of G M R E. And if R E is zero, then it goes back to what it was. Just R C over R M. That's what it really is. So ratio of two resistors. Gain has to be ratio, right? So it's a ratio of two resistors. Okay. Um, so that's basically the basic differential operation. How about the common mode? So this is, this is good. We can calculate what this is. So this was the differential equivalent half circuit. So let's go back to the circuit. If I, did I answer your question? That's a, so the question is that in the common mode, would it be inconsequential or not? Let me erase this, and then at the end, remind me again, and then we'll talk about it. Because I, that's, a good, great, that's, a great, that's another great question. So I'm going to remove these guys again, put back this thing, and keep this resistor here. So now, what we are doing, we are changing this, right? We are going back to the, now we are talking about the common mode. Let's talk about the common mode voltage. So we have VIC here and VIC there. It's the same thing. Essentially, they're both connected the same thing. So now what can I say about this terminal? Can I say the voltage, this voltage is 0 or doesn't change? That midpoint? No. That midpoint now, you're pushing both sides up and down. So that midpoint is going up and down. So are we done? We can't do anything about it? Well, we can be a little bit clever about this. The problem here is that this guy is not disappearing, obviously, right? This is, this is still there because that voltage is changing, so you can't replace it with a fixed voltage source of any value. Therefore, this guy is not going to disappear. But I want, and you can see, that's, that's kind of a sore spot, right? I mean, in the sense that it's just like it's sticking in the middle. It's messing up my symmetry. This is really symmetrical, actually, not anti-symmetrical. So if I want to keep it symmetrical, I would like to have it on both sides, make, make this stru structure symmetric. Can you think of making this, how we can make this symmetric? Do you agree that I can take this and replace it with two resistors on each side if there are each two REEs? Do you agree that this, was, this is equivalent to that? Because the parallel combination of two REEs, two two REEs is REE, REE, -E. right? So we can do that. Now, let's ask another question. Let's ask the question of what is this current? Or I'm going to actually ask you this different question. Which way is this current flowing? Is it flowing from left to right or from right to left? Which, what's the direction of this current? See, that's like a funnier way to ask the same question, but it kind of elucidates why the answer is what it is. So if you say left to right, I'll show you the mirror image. I take a mirror and show it to you in the mirror. I say, well, now it's going from right to left. So there's only one thing that satisfies both of these things, right? Zero. So this current has to be zero. Now, substitution theorem again, our friend. You have a branch whose current is identically zero. What can you replace it with? With a current source of value 0, which is an open circuit. So I can open this circuit, and nothing will happen. We are on firm ground, because we understand our network theory theorems fully. right? OK, so now two, my two half circuits have separated again. But this is a different half circuit, right? This is not the same half circuit. This is, if I draw the half circuit even like in transistor form, and it can be MOSFET or bipolar, it doesn't matter. 
This is going to be RC. This is going to be 2 REE. And this is VIC. And this is VOC. Co output common mode voltage. So I should, yeah, you should call that VOC now. This is VOC, VOC. What's the gain of this stage? Two, why, why two RC? RC, total resistance in the drain or output terminal divided by the total resistance in the terminal one, right? Total resistance in terminal two, total resistance in terminal one. Total resistance in terminal two or output. Now, if this were drain, this would be RD, OK? So that gain, A, V common mode, which is defined as VOC divided by VIC, is going to be RC. Well, there's a negative, and I didn't forget that there. Um, but I had forgotten it here. There is a negative RC. Well, there's alpha RC in the case of a bipolar. It doesn't matter, really. Uh, divided by RM plus 2 RE. It's really alpha RM and alpha here, and alpha here and alpha there. It doesn't matter. Um, which you can also write as, again, multiplied by GM. You can write as negative GMRC divided by 1 plus 2 GMREE. So this gain, let's compare these two gains with uh, this gain. Does the differential amplifier really do what we expect it to do? What, what, is it, what is the primary function? Amplify the differential and attenuate or amplify the, the common mode less, right? How much less? Well, that thing has a name. The ratio of these two gains is called common mode rejection ratio. So common mode rejection ratio, or CMRR for short, is defined as AV differential divided by AV common mode. If you divide these two by each other, you clearly see it's 1 plus 2 GM REE. -E. So now, right there, you can see the better your current source, the more your common mode rejection ratio, at least in this form, would be, right? Because the better your current, so tail current source, the higher REE -E is, and therefore this ratio becomes larger or in general, whatever the impedance of that current source is. Does it make sense? Are we good on that front? So this is the common mode rejection ratio. This is called common mode rejection ratio. Now, if you had those resistors, going back to your question, what would happen if there were two resistors here, really, if you kept them, right, the REs? What would they, where would they appear? Well, they would appear, they were here before, before we, open this thing, they were here, right? RE and RE. So what would happen when we open this? I still can open it. When we open it, then I have an RE here that I have to deal with. So this expression becomes RC divided by RM plus RE plus two RE. R -E -E. Yeah, this should be RE. Right? So that would just add to this list. Now, if that's that resistor, if you actually used it for making the uh, stage a little bit more linear, that can't be a very large resistor. So probably that resistor is going to be much smaller than that. Now in this case, essentially even like a lot of this thing, you can see for, for useful, for a stage worth its salt, this is probably going to be much larger than one. So essentially it's going to be two GMRE. Right? The common mode rejection ratio. So it's, yeah, that's what it is. So this, this, minus, this equal sign is not in the right place. These are not part of each other. Yeah? This is the differential gain, right? Oh, okay, this is the common mode gain. It's OK? Yeah. See it? Yeah. Yeah. So the ratio of those two. The ratio of this, which was the differential gain, to this, which is the common mode gain. Um, any other questions on this? Uh, so let's continue. 
and let's see where it, it takes us. So this was a basic stage, right? I mean, this was like this was the basic understanding of the differential input and output. So, so the other thing that we need to do and talk about a little bit, and again, this is exactly the same thing if it were a MOSFET. So I could redraw these circuits and say, look, hey, where is this thing? Um, so I could redraw this with a MOSFET or an arbitrary three-terminal device, and then call this RD, and then RCs become RDs, alphas disappear, which we didn't even start with, and then here that the common mode equivalent circuit becomes whatever, right? RD, and then you have the RSS, two RSS, and so on and so forth. So all of these things will remain similar. Um, so yeah, RCs become RDs, but other than that, these ratios, everything remains the same. Now, what the exact value of GM is, that would depend on the device. But from a small signal perspective, they are still the same. Now, the other thing that we need to do a quick calculation on, and it's not that hard, but it's just important to do quickly. If I ask you, what is the input resistance of this stage? Right? Let's go back, and let's get rid of these for, for the time being. And I'm asking you, what is the input resistance of the stage? Well, if you're talking about there are different input resistances. The resistance you see from, from a differential perspective is different from the resistance you see from, this, from a common mode perspective, right? Because there are different modes of operation. And this is important to remember. The differential resistance presented can be different from what common mode looks like. So what, would, what do you think it is, intuitively? You have, what do you see looking into the, if that's a differential, we're talking about differential operation. Um, each one of them is just, we said, it's a, this is a, what we call a virtual ground or differential ground, right, from a differential perspective. This, this point is like differential ground. So you have a common emitter on this side and a common emitter on this side with no degeneration. What is the input resistance of a common emitter with no degeneration? You're looking into the base of a transistor whose emitter is grounded, R pi. So you see one R pi on this side and one R pi on the other side. 2R pi, the input resistance. If, you, if you're not convinced, what we could do, we could go to the small signal model, the half circuit equivalent, and we would see that you have VID over 2 here. And then, of course, in that case, these are grounds, right? I mean, the differential equivalent circuits. Let me just get rid of these for now. So that's the differential equivalent circuit. And then if this was VID to begin with, so VID over 2, sorry, VID over 2, and this would be IX. So let's say VX over 2 and IX. VX over 2 over IX is R pi, right? Because this resistance is R pi. Yes, it is, this is alpha RM, but there's this current that cuts the current, that cuts this current by factor 1 minus alpha. And as a result, this becomes multiplied by beta plus 1. So it becomes Rm times beta becomes R pi. R pi, so the ratio of Vx over 2, so Vx over 2 divided by Ix is R pi. Therefore, Vx over Ix is going to be 2 R pi. This 2 goes to the other side. As simple as that. So from a differential perspective, it's just basically 2 R pi. What is the common mode? input resistance. So I'm going to put these connections back. So this is now the common mode half circuit equivalent. Well, from a common mode perspective, this is what you see, right? On each side. But two, those two sides, from a source perspective, these two are shorted together, right? Do you agree? So whatever each one of them presents, it would be half of that because you have two of it in parallel. You have one on this side and one on this side. The same source, right? So what is that input resistance? Well, what's the input resistance here? Looking into here, what do you see? Or looking into here? Well, looking into here, this is easy. For MOSFET, it's very easy. Low frequency stuff, so. And low frequency classic MOSFET model, infinity anyway. Two times infinity is still infinity. Or, but now, what is this resistance? For one of them, for common mode now, for bipolar. Uh, R pi plus beta R e, really beta plus one R e, but R e e, but beta plus beta R e, right? 
So that's what it is. But that's for half of it. Right? That's for one of them. They are in parallel. So it would be this thing, or two, I'm sorry, two. There's a two here. Divided by two. Right? The total resistance would be this divided by two. Because you have two of them in parallel. So the total input resistance for common mode would be this thing divided by 2, which would be r pi over 2 plus beta re, REE. In fact, if you take these two results together and combine them, you can see that the input equivalent circuit looks like this. There's an input equivalent circuit that would take both of these things into account. I'm sorry, r pi, r pi, no, no, not r pi, r pi, r pi, and this thing. So this is the input equivalent circuit. And you can see it gives you the correct value for both the, the differential and single-ended value. If I apply just differential signal, this node is going to be differential ground. So this, is, this resistor is not going to do anything. I see two r pi's in series. If I do common mode, these two are shorted together. So you see r pi over 2, so they're going to be parallel, because these two terminals will be shorted together if it's common mode, right? This is going to be r pi over 2 plus beta re. So the input of this differential pair looks like that in a bipolar. In a MOSFET, it looks like an open circuit. That's why we're doing some of these bipolar things also kind of like into bipolar, because that's more general. It shows you the more general case. Uh, any questions? OK, if there are no questions, let's do an example, a numerical example. Just get a feel for some of these things. And then we'll expand on this example and make better stages and increase the gain. And all this. But all of this is clear now? Good. Again, I'm going to use a bipolar one because that's probably, and, and then we'll do a MOSFET one. So to, to have both versions in your uh, repertoire or arsenal of things that you can use. So very basic stuff, vanilla differential pair with resistive load, VOD, VID. Sometimes you may see it like this. So that's the differential part. Let's say you have a tail current source with a parallel resistor. Let's say this is 200 microamps. Let's say this is 100 kilo ohms. So, and let's say my supply is um, whatever, five volts. Okay. Now, what would you pick the value of RC to be? How would you pick the value of RC? Let's say this is five volts. Now. You can't answer that question without me telling you what your common mode range is. Because if your common mode range is pretty high, it means that these transistors can go into saturation very quickly, because you can forward bias this junction very quickly. So this kind of stage, if it's NMOS based, this is good if your common mode reference is not going to be very high. Of course, if it's very low, then you will run into another problem, because this is not really going to be a current source. This is going to be another transistor, so then you will crunch it. Because let's say your input range is 0.5 volts. Let's go to common mode of the input is 0.5, right? You need a 0.7 here to turn it on, roughly, right? And then you need another 0.1 or 0.2 for this to not go into saturation, at least a 0.1 or 0.2. So you need at least 0.9, let's say a volt. If you go below a volt or 0.9 volts, the input common mode level, the DC level of the input. If it goes below that, then your transistor starts crunching and go into saturation and all bets are off. Now, how high can you go? Well, it depends on this RC, because when 200 milliamps goes through this RC, that would be the lowest voltage this node will have. So if I pick this to be, let's say, my RC to be 5 kilo ohms, what would the maximum drop of this resistor be? How low can it go? 500, 5 kilo ohms times 200 microamps, right? So that's 0.2 milliamps, 0.2 times 5. 
What's 0.2 times 5? 1. So it can drop 1 volt. So I'm pretty safe on that top. So, so basically, how high can this go? It can be, you don't, it can go almost 0.5 above that. So this can be as high as 4.5 volts. Right? Because you need at least 0.5 volts here to turn this on. So just turn this diode on. Uh, the other way, uh, sorry, the other way around. Yeah, this direction. So it means that if this is at one volt, this can be a half a volt above that. I'm sorry, if this is at four volts, four, five minus one, four volts, this is going to be at 4.5 volts. So the input range of this, the common input range for this is somewhere between one volt to 4.5 volts with these values. If you make your, that 10 kilo ohms, then it becomes 3.5 volts to one volts. Now, you can keep shrinking it. You can get, try to get more gain by increasing the RC, but then you're shrinking that range of common mode range. This is DC. This has nothing to do with the differential. And this is important when we start designing op amps. Because you will see that when you're cascading stages, you have to think about what the input ranges and output ranges are. So you have to think about what the common mode values are that you can keep there. Otherwise, you may think that, OK, all my small signal calculations work nicely. I plug it in. Instead of gain of 100,000, I'm getting a gain of 0.2. And you say, what's happening? Well, your transistors are in, not properly biased. They're not in the wrong, one of them is saturating or something. It's funny, it's happening. Anyway, so let's say we are in that up range of operation. Let's see what kind of gain we get from something like this. What is the gain? Uh, well, what gain? That's the question, right? The most important one is differential gain. So, well, for differential gain, we have to look at differential half circuits. What is the differential half circuit? It's this thing. It's just that. Right? What is the gain of that thing? It's neg so AV differential is defined as VOD divided by VID is negative GMRC parallel RO. So we haven't gotten to R. If 5K is probably going to be lower than your RO. Like that's why? If you're in doubt, let's calculate the RO. RO is going to be VA over IC. I didn't tell you what VA is. Let's say it was 100 volts. 100 volts divided by 100 microamps. So 1 over micro is a mega, right? So it's 1 mega ohm. So you have 1 mega ohm in parallel with 5 kilo ohms. It's 5 kilo ohms. Okay? So this is reasonably, I mean, this is a very good approximation, really. So what, and what is GM? So what is my GM? That's the first thing I should have calculated, really. It's IC over VT, right? I'm running at, we know at 1 milliamp, we have 40 millisiemens. So at 100 microamps, I have 4 millisiemens. Or RM of 25 ohms. OK? So it's a ratio of 5 kilo ohms divided by 25 ohms, or 4 millisiemens times 5 kilo ohms. Which is what? So you have a gain of 20. Eh, OK, not too shabby. It's OK. We have a gain. It's not amazingly high, but just like, yes? Oh, yeah, you're right, actually. RM is 250 ohms, not 250. Thank you. 25 ohms for 1 milliamp, so this is 250 ohms. Thank you. Um, yes. So. Yeah, so, but it's basically 20, a gain of 20, right? Um, now, fine, so that's a differential gain. Sounds reasonable. I mean, it's not very high. We'll make them higher as we go. But it has at least some gain. How about common mode gain? What is the common mode gain? A, V, common mode, or A, V, common mode, or A, V, C. Um, what is that? Well, I have to look at the equivalent common mode half circuit. What does that look like? Well, remember, we split this into two, 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 uh, two 200 kilo ohms, right? And, we, we, and they, we said that the, if both of them are going up and down, that midpoint is going to have carry no current, because this will disappear anyway in the small signal, because it's constant. So the equivalent half circuit for that one, one would be two REE and RC. So the gain for this is simply the ratio of this to the total resistance there. 
So the gain is going to be negative RC divided by alpha RM or RM plus RE. So it is basically negative GMRC divided by 1 plus GMRE, e, 2RE, sorry, 2RE, okay, because you split it into 2. And OK, so what is this value? What is GMREE? -E? 4 millisiemens times 200 kilo ohm. I'm oh, sorry, 4 millisiemens times 100 kilo ohm is 400, right? Times 2 is 800. So this is whatever that is. So it's AV differential divided by 801. So your common mode gain is 20 divided by 800, right? Is 1 over 40. You can see the power of a differential pair, right? It amplifies your differential signal by a factor of 20. It attenuates your common mode, this in this example, by a factor of 40. And your common mode rejection ratio, of course, is 801, which is the ratio of these two things. So if I ask you, what is the CMRR? It's 800. I mean, CMRR is usually shown. It's 801, but it's 800. Is measured in dB. You want it to be high, so things that can be very large usually are measured in dB. <laughs> um, so you want it to be very large, very high. Um, so that's one basic calculation. Now, if you had, if I, if we threw in that back, that those degeneration resistors, what would happen? Let's say we throw back these guys in, and let's make them some reasonable value. Let's say we make them one kilo ohm. One kilo ohm. Let's see if we can do it without writing equations. What's the gain, differential gain, roughly? Roughly, what is it? Negative 5, yeah, right? Why? Because it's the ratio of the total corrector resistance to, to the total emitter resistance. So it's 500, 5 kilo ohm divided by 1.25 kilo ohms. So it's a little bit less than 5, right? It's whatever it is, like 4 point something. So that's what your differential gain is going to be. Because if you think about the differential half circuit, basically you're grounding here. So you have a circuit that looks like that, except for the fact that this is 5 kilo ohm, and now this is 1, uh, one kilo ohm, it's this guy. Now, what is your common mode gain? It's what's the ratio, what's the, the common mode rejection ratio? So it's, you get basically a 1 kilo ohm added to this um, 200 kilo ohm. It's going to be still 200 kilo ohm for all intents and purposes, right? So it's this, the ratio, the reduction ratio is the same. So your common mode rejection ratio is the same. Your, both your common differential mode and common mode have been reduced by the same factor. Because as you can see, the common mode ratio gain is simply just the differential gain divided by that ratio. That ratio didn't change much. So yes, both of them went down, but the ratio remained the same. I mean, it became a little bit larger, a tiny bit. Not massively. So that's fine. There's another variation on this, so that's the last thing we're going to do uh, for today, is you can achieve this in a different way. And it's interesting to think about it. You can do it this way. I can do it by polar or MOSFET, so I'm going to do it MOSFET. Let's think about what the equivalent half circuits of this circuit would be. Let's say this is RE, 2RE, and this is IEE, -E, oh, well, we call this, we, call, we should call it RS now. But, and this is ISS over 2, and ISS over 2. And this is RD and RD. What does this do? Think about this. If I were to draw equivalent half circuits for differential and common mode, how would they look like? Well, let's start with the differential. For the differential, what should we do with the resistor? Split it, exactly. Some of you are doing this, which is exactly the right thing. Split it into two. 
So write it as two REEs. REEs, not REEs, sorry, REEs. So now it's easy to see where the differential ground is, if you have differential input, right? Where is the differential ground? It's in the middle. And this one disappears in the small signal model, of course. So what do you have? What's your gate now? Rd divided by Rm plus Re. It's the degenerate case, right? Which I don't know. We didn't write it anywhere. But it's basically the same thing. The same thing as having these resistors here, at least from this calculation perspective. Now, how about the common mode? Well, each one of them would have twice as much as R RS because the current is half, right? So each one of them would be two RSSs. So again, it would be the same. So is there a fundamental difference between this circuit and this circuit? This implementation and that implementation, or that topology and this topology? Not at, at this level, right? Again, difference between math and physics. From what we saw, I mean, the math is correct. So, I mean, I can just put this back again, back in again, and to RE. By the way, in the common mode case, there would be no current flowing in this branch. So, this will disappear. Um, but anyway, is there any, any fundamental difference other than what I just said? Because that would make a little tiny difference in the REs and RE, RE in that expression. But other than that, any practical difference? Do you think there's practically this is better or that is better or when one is better than the other one or are they the same? Think about the discussion we had about matching for the break, right? Let's put it in that context. And it's not a clear-cut answer. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, even if it's non-uniform, you naturally will form the common mode point wherever the half of it is, right? Or that that, that differential. So that's great. But like most situations, like many situations, you have. Sh do you want to say something? I guess before I say. Something? Right, you've shifted the problem from one place to another. So now your current sources have to match, right? Which is, which is fine, I mean, exactly, that's the, the correct thing to say. So which one is better? It depends. Which, which, which has better matching? If you can match your resistors better, use this. And it changes from process to process, from generational process to generational process, from decade to decade, things of that sort, change, 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 you know, the way that things are done would affect what the matching properties of these things are and what the matching properties of these things are. So if, you're current, if you can match your actives better, this is your better choice. This is better. If you can match your passives better, this is your choice. If you can't match either of them, either of them better, it doesn't matter. Pick whatever works for you. All right? Any questions? All right? Well, see you next time.